For centuries, humans have created maps to help us understand our world and to ultimately serve as guides. Imagine what would be possible by having a map that could dynamically and with great accuracy show you how the Earth has changed week over week, month over month, year over year. We could get a bird's eye view of the impact of different resources, such as food and freshwater management, wildlife and ecosystems conservation, sustainable urban development, climate change, public health, etc. Such an amazing data project is here and is called Dynamic World. It offers a free daily data set that is updated every 14 seconds for anyone to build applications with the intention of deriving ecological insights from it. What's even more interesting is that because you can access mapping data of all the different surfaces on the Earth called land cover maps as daily data sets, rather than the traditional annual summary on a static map, it helps unlock greater flexibility for investigation. This global and high resolution land cover data set has an amazing granularity of 10 meters per pixel. And the geospatial data that Google Earth Engine uses to deliver this service originates from the European Space Agency satellite called Sentinel-2 from the EU Copernicus mission, which takes an image of the entire Earth roughly every five to 10 days since mid 2015. Dynamic World uses AI to classify these images of the planet into different land categories automatically. By leveraging cloud computing, we accelerate the process of labeling what's on the land, which up to very recently took years to analyze, but today can be accessed in hours or seconds, making it a powerful sustainability platform for everyone. Dynamic World was built by my peers in Geo for Everyone in collaboration with the World Resource Institute Society. It can help with things like quantifying losses from a wildfire. This is an example of the 300,000 acres of beautiful trees from a city in California called Chico in just a few days after being impacted by a wildfire. And on a global scale, we can quantify forest and ecosystem loss due to changes in the way land is used from human activity such as agriculture and animal farming. This sector, for example, is estimated to produce more than 12% of the carbon pollution globally. But by better understanding its interdependent effects on habitats, we can remediate with regenerative solutions. Companies interested in having more regenerative supply chains can use Dynamic World, as Unilever is presently doing so, in order to help them locate deforestation due to palm oil plantations. And so, in inspiration of this project, we dedicate this episode to sharing how to get started with training a model that helps label satellite pictures into different land surface classifications to understand how we are changing the Earth. Tanya. She works on Google's Geo for Everyone team focused on apps for nature and conservation. Yeah, so one of the challenges of producing land cover data sets are that they're incredibly tedious and manual and require a lot of human expertise to produce. You need to have experts that understand very specific biomes, very specific ecoregions, and know what's on the ground at that, at that place. A lot of these training data sets are um, laborious to produce and take a lot of um, expertise. For modern machine learning approaches, you still need a ton of training data. We really hope that people are going to take dynamic world data and produce um, derivative data sets like different plantations, different crop types, uh, so we can better understand things like supply chain traceability as well as governments who are really struggling to meet and trying and you know working hard to meet the pledges that they're making at, uh, at climate agreements or climate conferences and biodiversity conferences. They need tools to be able to track and measure their progress um, towards those agreements that they've set. You can learn more about how to access Dynamic World in our video's description, or you can load it as an image collection in Earth Engine's editor. 
You can also visit their beautiful web app that demonstrates the art of the possible, where you can choose a date range, pick a point to analyze the model's confidence level of land surface via a chart, and toggle different map layers such as satellite or Google Maps view. A big shout out to the brilliant minds behind this project, including Googler Chris Brown for all his AI contributions. My peers and I in developer relations were inspired to explore how to approach this problem of automating land cover maps by building a geospatial multi-class classification model, which is a fancy way of saying a model that classifies many different things from satellite imagery. And so let's dive in. Here is a bird's eye view of the architectural diagram. So for starters, we authenticate into an existing Google Cloud project or create a new one via a free trial. We will also need a Google Earth Engine account, which is free. Next, we identify a data set with labeled classifications. And so we used Earth Engine's catalog and picked a data set called European Space Agency World Cover. Make a note, we could use multiple data sets if you wanted to combine elevation data, for example, but for simplicity, we only used one data set. Next, we need to understand the shape of our inputs and outputs, which has three dimensions, width, height, and number of bands. In this case, these bands correspond to measurements from sensors of that lovely rainbow electromagnetic spectrum from the satellite and can collect values such as infrared data to water vapor, for example. The outputs are the probability of a classification of each pixel. And since we have nine classification types, we then have nine values. And each value is the probability of being a type of surface on the Earth. We then typically take the highest probability as the final label. Now, I glossed over this matter now, but I cover how this problem is similar to image classification in our prior episode on carbon pollution monitoring, if you feel inspired to check it out. Next, we use the Earth Engine APIs function to create a balanced data set and make sure the data set is shuffled in a random order. We do this to minimize bias in our model. Next, we choose how much of this data will go to building a training and validation data sets and decided they would respectively have an 80-20 ratio. And we ensure that no data point is shared in both data sets. We now wait for some time for Earth Engine to export both of these data sets into a data processing format called TF records into our Google Cloud storage bucket. This is a file format optimized for TensorFlow, which is an ML library. And now it's time to train a model. With TensorFlow, we read the training and validation data sets that Earth Engine created. With the training data sets specifically, we define the model in Python with TensorFlow Keras, which is a high level API or interface to TensorFlow, and use the validation data set to check the predictions on data it has never seen before. We train the model in Vertex AI, which then saves it into cloud storage. Next, we host the model on Google Cloud Run, which functions as a prediction service. You can then create a visual interface over it. In this case, we use NumPy and Matplotlib in Colab to see a per year snapshot visualization and an animated GIF. So what's next? If you would like to review this process in greater detail in the description below, I've included the link to an interactive notebook with all the code used to build the sample written by David Cavazos, who has co-created this series with me. You can also find a blog post and several helpful resources and community. I'm going to leave you with a lovely fun fact Tanya shared before we end. And as a friendly reminder, if you found this content helpful, you can subscribe or leave a comment friends. Cheers. Everywhere I go now, in my head, I classify the land cover. I'll be driving down the street and I'll be like, that's grass or that's what, you know, that's trees or what would we classify that as? You know, you think about like 10 meter by 10 meter pixels covering the globe and what do each of those pixels get classified as, right? It's super dorky, but I guess that's true and personal. <laughs>